Quella di questa sera è... Welcome to this giovedì scienza. This uh, evening is particularly interesting. We have Roberto Battiston, whom I'd like to welcome and thank, uh, because uh, he has... Uh, given us a bit of time, uh, carving it out of a very complicated uh, life uh, on this planet and on another planet because he also works uh, on the satellite and uh, the spatial station. He deals with physics and astrophysics, uh, scientists uh, and uh, People who study humanities are fascinated by symmetries, but more so asymmetries. Primo Levi, who was both a chemist and a writer, who had been particularly surprised and interested by the fact that some molecules are chiral. That is to say, they are asymmetrical. Uh, they're one specular to the other, but they can't do the same thing when they interact with other molecules. Uh, one of the things that had surprised him, and not only him, the uh, molecules that determine life uh, are, and this is obviously not a political implication, are chiral but to the left. So this is symmetry is very important for physics because most of the theory of physics are from Newton to Maxwell on electromagnetism and more so even relativity, be it a special or general. And as you know, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the general relativity this year. All of this uh, uh, came from um, the fact that the scientists were trying to identify symmetries. But every now and again, you have an asymmetry, which is very interesting. It's a, a bit like the mole that Marilyn Monroe had on her face. Uh, certainly, it's a not. Uh, uh, wasn't made didn't make her ugly, quite the opposite, uh, but it wasn't symmetric. Uh, and when you have a mole on the face of uh, science, uh, then you look for why it's there. And currently, today, we only see matter, but we know, and we know from the mathematical formulae and also from the experiments that we've had, that there is another universe which is as, as big, which is antimatter. And antimatter can't be seen. And Antimatter has, well, was seen for the first time in a mathematical formula, in a mathematical symmetry. It was then uh, found, uh, the evidence was found in the cosmic rays uh, and produced uh, in large amounts uh, in accelerators. And Battiston, amongst other things, worked in CERN, where these things uh, are standard practice. But you can't see antimatter. Why? Because uh, there was a, a breaking of symmetry, which is uh, uh, what is will be the focus of this evening's conference. Roberto Battiston, I'm not going to give you a biography because you have uh, all the material with you, which uh, summarizes his work and also offers one of uh, his uh, presentations on the space station. He has uh, an alpha magnetic spectrometer sp experiment uh, which analyzes all the cosmic rays uh, and also to find antimatter. It would be very interesting to find anti-helium. And this uh, is uh, the objective that we have not yet attained, but which could really end up uh, by proving to be the key to open the secrets of antimatter. The floor to you, sir. I'm very pleased to be here, this very beautiful hall, very welcoming, and to try and explain why I chose uh, the title, Hunting for Antimatter, I start to illustrate what antimatter is. Uh, it's an object of uh, the world of physics. How was it discovered? What does it mean? And how have we been able to carry out some of the research projects uh, to try and understand uh, the origin of our universe? Let us begin a century ago, just over a century ago. 
where cosmic rays were discovered. In previous, um, in the previous slide, you saw particles uh, that were wandering in space. Um, the space around us uh, is uh, empty, but up to a certain point. We're talking about very small fractions. It's not completely empty. It's, uh, there are elementary particles uh, that virtually run at the speed of light, more or less. Some are a bit faster, some are a bit slower, but basically at that speed. And these particles were discovered at the beginning of the last century, 1912. I'll be talking about this because it's a very important discovery, led to a Nobel Prize Award, but especially because it gave rise to a revolution in modern physics, because it gave it set the beginning of particle physicists. Up to the beginning of the 20th century, we knew atoms, atoms in chemistry. We had understood that there were some light electron particles. In fact, uh, the electrons had been discovered or separated uh, 10 years before the turn of the century. We'd understood that there was a proton, but it was not clear what was at the center of what. But all the rest of it, uh, was unknown. All the other particles uh, and uh, the neutron were discovered, for example, much later. Why? Because we lacked the tools. Uh, because Rutherford, with the first atoms, to understand that there was a part that was heavy, was the first one to use uh, uh, natural radioactivity of alpha particles so to carry out particular studies. It was, that atom is very small. It has always been with us in the history of humanity. Chemistry has always uh, been with us. But before we were able to understand that they were very small particles, it took a long time. And at a certain point along this path, uh, we began to understand that there were other types of particles. Uh, they were smaller than an atom, uh, elementary particles. Uh, and how did this discovery take place? Uh, well, it took place uh, oh, using methods uh, which uh, are very simple, if we look at them with today's eyes, uh, uh, with a hot air balloon, which made it possible for them uh, to um, carry out tests at a few kilometers of oh, the gentleman who here is Victor Hess with an instrument. This is uh, these are Victor Hess's students. Uh, these were PhD students or the equivalent. That's all was very simple at the time. Um, and he used this object. This object is an electrometer. It's about as big as an old alarm clock. Uh, it's, if you look at it carefully, in the center, you see that there's a sort of arch which goes downwards uh, with some wires which are pulling. And they're pulling two vertical gold wires. Uh, and uh, they are cl one close to the other. And there's a microscope that looks from behind. At the top, there's a point where you can charge it uh, electrically. Um, the, here you can see they, what they used was basically rubbing wool or something like that. If you do that, you charge the gold wires. Uh, there's a sort of micro arch, and they separate. And if you look at them with the microscope, you can see what the distance is. And you can see whether, in time, they're getting closer. This is an electrometer. And they had noticed uh, that uh, these uh, el charges, electrometers, uh, discharged uh, after a while. So they'd been improved uh, to try and avoid uh, this uh, loss of charge. Uh, and uh, they couldn't understand why the charge uh, um, disappeared. So they said at one point it's not a technological problem. There's something which discharged them. Well, they started to bring them everywhere in, in caves, at the top of mountains, isolated underwater, uh, insulated. They'd gone. They were very confused data. Sometimes it increased, sometimes it decreased. Uh, that was the speed at which they discharged it. So Victor Hess first decided to go on the Eiffel Tire, but he didn't understand exactly what was happening. And then uh, with, uh, he said, let's go a few miles up and let us try to understand what is happening to electrometers. Uh, if you understand it or see it with today's eyes, it's a stupid idea. First of all, 
you must be a bit odd to like this machine because it's not really a beautiful machine. It's like to try and uh, understand why a tap is dripping uh, and you've got a whole building and you have to understand. But there's some people who get interested in this uh, and you always learn something. And then to go on a hot air balloon uh, with the methods uh, which were very basic, you really have uh, to be following an idea or a dream to try and understand uh, a detail which was unexplained, which was always uh, the hallmark of science uh, to f understand why there were some details uh, that were unexplainable, wherever this uh, detail was. He used uh, this. He got the Nobel Prize in 1936. So what for? Let's see. This is Mr. Hess looking at one of his instruments. He was older here, but he became very famous because he built electrometers that were very precise. But going up in the air, he measured the speed at which uh, the, uh, his electrometers were discharged, and he noted how long it took for the charge to disappear. For example, if he said if it took this, uh, then he wrote it down, and the further up he go, he realized that slowly the speed at which uh, they discharged was much slower, as if the source of this charge, uh, which clearly contrasted the charge of the electrometer came from below. The further away he was from Earth, the slower the process was, which means that the charge was affected by something at low altitude. But after a few kilometers, suddenly the speed increased markedly very clearly, reaching, when you reach about four or five kilometers, I can't remember exactly, it was quite clear that the speed was much, much greater, as if uh, the, at this point, uh, were affected by uh, what we now call cosmic rays. When he discovered cosmic rays in 1912, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded in uh, 1936, 24 years later, he didn't know what he had discovered. He published the results. The results were quite famous because it explained, if nothing else, uh, how electrometers worked. It was something from outside the Earth. For the first time, a physicist in microscopic physics it needed co the cosmos uh, to explain something which was happening on Earth. But what? he had in fact seen were the cosmic rays that penetrating in the atmosphere, creating secondary particles uh, that he didn't know, uh, that uh, we call them muons, uh, puons, uh, neutrinos, uh, antiprotons, and so forth, so on and so forth. But, um, and some of them are neutral and other ones have a charge, but these are the ones uh, that uh, were the charged ones uh, that were causing uh, the problem uh, with uh, the charges. Um, in the years that followed, this is an image uh, of, uh, mm, which was taken, taken, the picture was taken in 1939, and uh, the conferences on cosmic rays uh, uh, became very popular, because in those years, uh, elementary particles were discovered one after the other. Positron, for example, we were talking about positron. The first uh, uh, antimatter particle was discovered in 32 and 37, uh, mu plus mu, le, mu negative, uh, two unstable particles in 47, the pi plus, pi minus, uh, uh, two mesons uh, which were charged, very different from the mu's, uh, which are a different uh, part of elementary physics, pa elementary particle physics. And then so on. More and more were discovered as time went on. They were strange particles. Strange means uh, that they opened up another door in, uh, to the history. Pi zero in the 50s, uh, it was a heavy photon uh, which decays uh, into two photons. Uh, and then K zero, which is a very strange particle in 52, even particles that were heavy, he heavy protons, if we want to call them with like that, the delta, lambda, and then sigma plus sigma minus in 53 a psi, that is to say, a, a very particular particle. You'll say, well, what are these particles? 
Well, since this evening's seminar does not concern the system of elementary particles, I'll just tell you that physicists have discovered an incredible amount of physics, of elementary physics, which had always remained um, hidden because nearly all these particles uh, are unstable. That is to say, they're created uh, when there is a primary particle uh, that hits uh, a nucleus in uh, the uh, atmosphere. It lives in nanoseconds, microseconds, uh, picoseconds. Then they decay in unstable particles, which means uh, that uh, if you don't have an accelerator which produces them, and at that time there weren't any accelerators, these things uh, disappear. So in the 50s, uh, this is what you had, and now it is the, we have CERN with an accelerator that produces uh, lots of these, uh, uh, but the cosmic rays uh, produce them uh, free of charge, uh, which is uh, determined also uh, by the interaction between the cosmic rays uh, and uh, the atmosphere, and with a lot of intelligence, uh, you're able to identify them one by one. And, and understand what type of physics um, is at stake. Now, in this image, Victor Hess, let me see if I can, no. Victor Hess is the one at the center. He's holding a briefcase. I lead, read some of the names of the physicists, Bete Shapiro, Compton, Compton scattering, somebody knows uh, or might know, Teller, atomic bomb, with Fermi, Eckerter, who was uh, Goldsmith, who they were theoretician, Oppenheimer, you all know who Oppenheimer was, Hess, uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson's chamber, Bruno Rossi, who was a great expert, an Italian expert who went to the States, Auger, a Frenchman, Heisenberg, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, Wheeler, very famous uh, for the general gravity study. So people who are milestones uh, of physics in the last century met uh, to talk about the new discoveries uh, that were taking place in physics. The discovery, the most important discovery of all, took place, uh, happened nearly immediately. The first particle that was discovered, um, because cosmic rays, uh, as I was saying, were discovered because of what they did with electrometers, but then we discovered particles uh, one by one, uh, was positron. It's a very, it's a real, we're gonna sp spend a few minutes on positrons because that's the beginning of it all. In those years, Paul Dirac, uh, who uh, was uh, a genius of the theoretical physics, uh, who didn't speak very few elegant formulas, uh, who loved symmetry, loved the mathematics uh, that he himself had developed uh, to resolve a number of problems, uh, uh, which became very important, uh, wrote an equation which for the first time put together some properties of relativity, you know, that is energy and mass in certain conditions, uh, uh, which is what E equal MC squared, uh, but we can be more complicated, but that's basically what it is, uh, with uh, the properties of uh, the recent discovery at the time, which was quantum mechanics. Uh, and here you saw the probability that a certain uh, phenomenon will be a particle, a particular, but as such it cannot be observed, but only the squared gives a, a physical meaning to it uh, while the, while, you see that uh, here you have the formula worth another seminar. But putting these two together, but in any case, I won't explain them here today, and to simplify it, it contained a, a very simple term, which was m squared. Since the square of a number can be obtained obtaining by multiplying the number by itself, whether it is uh, plus or minus, positive or negative. And since he was writing a fundamental equation where all the aspects uh, which emerge from this equation had a deep meaning and in on the um, on, on the actual situation, instead of throwing away the negative uh, symbol, he asked himself, why? Why was it a quadratic equation, and why wasn't it a linear equation? 
And I won't explain why today, but because otherwise it was not possible, he said, then there must be a state of particles which satisfies this equation both with a positive m but also with negative m. And hence the theory of antimatter. Now, We'll dwell on this a second. What's the meaning of thinking of a negative mass? Here we're talking about an inertial mass, and not a gravitational mass, not the one which attracts us towards the Earth, but the one which is responsible for inertia. What's the meaning of a mass that has a negative, what is an, it would appear to be uh, impossible, because if I push, it accelerates, and if it, I stop it, it accelerates, while here, it would be the opposite. If I push, it would slow down, and if I pull, it would accelerate, which is opposite, uh, the opposite of what we would expect it to be. Another question, the negative mass, does it fall or is it uh, repelled upwards? Uh, is it moved upwards against the Earth? That is to say, is it the opposite of an electrical field that plus one minus attracts itself and plus plus or minus minus uh, repel each other? Or in the specific case, uh, does this minus uh, symbol have other the thing. Don't think uh, too much. Don't think of antiparticles as a negative mass, but think, the, think of them as Feynman did. Feynman, a few years later, asking himself about this problem, which is anything but a trivial problem, said that uh, formally I think about it like this. A particle of antimatter is exactly like a particle of matter which goes backward in time. I don't know if it's easier to say this. Maybe yes, it is. Maybe it isn't. But in terms of Feynman's diagrams, it's very easy to draw a particle that goes back in time. Space and time in quantum mechanics it can be played as positive or negative elements. So it is easier for you to understand that an anti-matter is a positive matter particle, but that goes behind with time. This doesn't mean that you will fully understand the concept, but I simply wanted to explain the story of the mathematics uh, which led to the discovery of antimatter. Dirac, as I said, was uh, interested in fundamental things. He wrote the article. He said these particles must exist. Uh, they have different characteristics, these particles, opposite characteristics. Uh, for example, their electric charge, but also the mass. In terms of what I mentioned, it can be seen as a, a minus mass, certainly a different state. Um, and uh, he even said that if there is antimatter, and this uh, equation is perfectly symmetrical with positive and negative mass, and therefore there must be also atoms, and therefore also anti-stars. And then the idea was that some of the stars that we see, since light and anti-light are the same thing, because for a photon, this type of equation, the mass of photon is equal to zero, is meaningless. So the photon and anti-photon are exactly the same thing. So the light of a distant star might uh, be emitted by an anti-atom and therefore be uh, the star and anti-star would be exactly the same thing, but if there is a cosmic ray and an anti-cosmic ray which reaches us, uh, this would have uh, different properties, uh, and they could be observed. With his theory, in 1932, he opened the door to the notion of particle and antiparticle. This type of equation that he wrote is a very general equation which concerns the mass and energy of whatever elementary particle. It is clear that if there's an electron, there must be an anti-electron, which is called a positron. The proton must have an anti-proton, which is called the anti-proton, pi plus, pi minus, k plus, k minus, and deuterium, too. It would have d plus, and there's also a d minus which was uh, its correspondent, the anti-deuterium, uh, with an anti-proton and an anti-neutron. This is the theory. Uh, lots of theories, but you have to prove it. The history of Positron is a fascinating story. There is a book by Frank Claus that I suggest you read. It's called Antimatter. And uh, this uh, discovery 
uh, was not uh, taken on board by large numbers of great scientists. There were other studies that could have rest. This led to this. Skobelskin and Dirac saw with his eyes probably images of antiparticles, and I'll show you what they look like, which were brought because Blackett, who was another very important scientist, a British one, Beppe Chiellini, who was a very famous scientist from Milan, uh, and Beppo Sachs is a very important satellite, which bears his name, and also Robert Milligan. Robert Milligan was a very important U.S. physicist who was very ambitious, uh, who knew how to use uh, communication. I think he was also man of the year on time and so on. And Millikan had discovered that the charges uh, could not be dividable. That is to say, there was a minimum. Millikan's experiment was uh, that uh, the charge is either zero or one or two or minus one, minus two. The can be, these can be quantified. All these people, there are historical documents, uh, missed what was important. At that time, and we're now in the 30s, uh, particles uh, had been, we're no longer in 1912, they were the bubble chambers, uh, and there was the possibility also to take photos uh, with systems, uh, with uh, took photos uh, when the particles went by. So these images which I'm showing you, which are in a magnetic field, we show us uh, how there are some particles uh, that bend to the right and some to the left. Uh, all of them, in this case, uh, came from above. So it was quite clear that there were positive uh, particles and negative particles. But at the time, it was quite clear that uh, the neutron was ne uh, positive and the proton was negative. And so one might have thought that all the ones bending to the right, presuming that uh, they were protons and all the others were electrons, uh, sorry. So these images uh, uh, came, was shown to all of these, uh, Dirac, uh, Blackett, Millikan. Uh, but there was Anderson, who was one of Millikan's students, uh, who carried out uh, uh, experiments in the lab with a system like this, uh, which was a magnet. And um, he measured the cosmic rays uh, in going into that room, in this room too, we've got some now. And after having produced a number of secondaries uh, through the ceiling, we have cosmic rays. They form particles, and they can be observed. They're no longer primaries, they're secondaries. And he did these sort of measurements and then took the results to Millikan and was saying, hey, boss, there's something strange here, because uh, we seem to have particles that behave as if they were electrons, uh, but they bend as if they were, uh, well, Millikan said, you're wrong, change this, uh, you've, this is some probably with your cables that's wrong, it can't be, it can't be. Well, this uh, was happening uh, to Dirac, uh, Occhialini, and Blackett, uh, that is to say that because they had seen the same images, uh, and Dirac, uh, who was the one who had conceived antimatter, didn't understand when he see it. And Anderson did something which is, he published on his own. He went on and on, his boss had said, if Millikan, who was very ambitious, if he had guessed, imagined what was happening, he would have published on his own without Anderson, clearly. But in this case, it was Anderson that published on his own without Millikan, and thanks to this, to this type of images. What does Anderson do? He did something which was very important. He put a slice of lead. The electron, which is light, loses more energy than a proton, which is heavy. If you calculate it, you know the type of mechanism. So if an electron enters at a certain energy within a lead or iron, in any case, heavy metal, uh, and it comes out when, with a, a decrease in energy, this is an electron. But if, uh, for given us it's without, it, it exists without much influence, uh, then it's a proton. This is a historical photograph. In this case, the particle comes from below. Why? Why would the cosmic rays come below? Because in the, the decaying, all the cosmic rays, uh, which is what I drew, every now and again there's a decay, and the cosmic ray 
bumps up, comes up, but they're very confused. In this case, uh, you can prove that they uh, started uh, from below upwards and uh, in the magnetic field, it went straight here, very relativistic. It went through uh, lead and it bent it more because it has lost a significant amount of energy. You calculate it and you see that this particle, by bending like this, has a positive uh, charge, but losing so much energy, it cannot be but an electron, which means that it is a positive electron, therefore it is a positron. This is one of the effects that uh, were discussed in the article and which meant immediately Anderson, four years later, gave him the Nobel Prize because uh, when this was put together with Dirac's theory, clearly they had opened an incredible chapter in the history of physics. Think about what it meant to have seen antimatter. In, as a positron, this is a particle uh, which, uh, in Feynman's meaning, is going, beha is going back in time. It's an antiparticle, or it's an antiparticle with a negative mass, but we didn't know what this concept meant. So in any case, it's a piece of the universe which is totally different uh, from the one we're used to. Since it's anti, this positron, as soon as it can cross an electron, it uh, forms energy, photons, light. Photons are antiparticles in themselves. The antimatter, every time it can uh, destroy itself, does it. So it is a parallel world that cannot uh, survive alongside the world we're living in this room. So in normal condition, there is, there's very little antimatter. You produce a lot, it, but it dies, so to speak, uh, in uh, the blink of an eye. So when you see this particle and you realize what it is, this is about half of the universe uh, in the sense uh, of the physical uh, equations of possible states of the matter. Seen one, you understand uh, lots of things, uh, thanks also to Dirac's uh, theory. From the positron onwards, antimatter became uh, part, uh, or more clearly, part of physics uh, of elementary particles in 1954, an Italian, Emilio Segrain and Chamberlain, who was uh, British, discovered the antiproton. Uh, this is uh, no longer with cosmic rays, uh, but uh, an accelerator. They got the Nobel Prize in 1959. In 65, uh, with the accelerator, the antideuterium was uh, produced, uh, antiproton and antineutron, obviously double mass because there was a neutron and it ended up on the front page of the New York Times uh, because clearly with the instability with the uh, Russian uh, economy, which is a constant and it still exists 50 years later, but they discovered that they were something new. Physicists produce antimatter particles in complex form. Currently, antimatter is uh, practically very easy to produce in our labs. In fact, we've managed uh, in very particular conditions uh, to produce uh, very complex antimatter. In Brooklyn Haven in America, there's an iron accelerator called RICH, uh, which manages uh, to have collisions between lead particles and uh, energy. And uh, when, they when they collide, uh, then you have a production, which is a bit like fireworks. There's so many of them. And they have managed to develop experiments which over the past few years have produced protons with these particles. They've produced protons, deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, but also antiprotons, antideuteron, anti-helium-3, and anti-helium-4. So, in a nuclear term, we know that we can produce antimatter in a laboratory condition, but as you see, uh, 
if you have a collision between two heavy nucleuses on the vertical axis, which I think you can read, every time you move to a more complex level of antimatter from one antiproton to an antiproton plus an antineutron plus antideuterium, there is a factor of between one and the 10,000 less times. It's a uh, if I want to have three, then, say, to helium-3, anti-helium-3, it's uh, 1,000 times more difficult. And if you want four, the anti-alpha particle, two antiprotons, two antineutrons, is 1,000 times more difficult. You can do it in a lab. You can produce them, but they're very difficult. And uh, But usually, when you produce them and then they collide against the walls, uh, they disappear. But you can do it. There is a deep symmetry between and among all the particles, even the complex complex ones, even if there are nucleuses of helium, and the corresponding antiparticles. In Geneva, we also know how to produce antiatoms of helium. We take an antiproton and an antineutron, we slow them down because they have to bind at very low energies. We produce thousands and thousands of them, and we're studying the excitation and the de-excitation of the hydrogen atoms to see if there's anything difficult different, but everything's the same, everything's symmetrical, but they're anti, and then they disappear. And the universe, what's the universe got to do with all this? Well, there's a small problem here. Since we believe, and there's evidence of this fact, that the universe is the effect of an enormous explosion, initial explosion of uh, a state uh, which developed at a very, very high temperature, much, much higher than the millions of degrees. It's uh, what we call a singularity, a condition of a very dense matter at absolutely high temperatures. Uh, we go towards the infinite, and then this becomes meaningless. But in any case, there is no limit uh, to the amount of energy the first seconds. It's called Big Bang. We can then talk about why the Big Bang happened, what happened, so on. Well, this is another story. But in the first instance, in the first billionth of a second, uh, I'll say it in the f 10 to the minus 43 seconds, everything happened. And in particular, we take it uh, that uh, it was symmetrical between matter and antimatter, because in this boom of energy between light and particles, there was room for everyone. There were lots of, uh, there was many uh, particles as antiparticles. Then something happened. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, because we couldn't cope uh, uh, with an environment where there was as much matter and as antimatter. Clearly, matter and antimatter were, from a certain point of view, at least in some parts of the universe, matter, which that's us, one. The problem is uh, to explain what happened to antimatter. Well, there are two possibilities, to say it in very simple words. Either antimatter was unlucky, as I say, there is a minor effect that we haven't been able to discover experimentally. But when two particles of uh, matter and antimatter collide every now and again, the matter particle destroys the antimatter one, even if it were one out of every 100 billion, or they separated at a given period in parts, different parts of the universe. We don't know how that happened. We know that there is evidence of this colossal creation of matter and antimatter because certainly in the first instance, so while they were created, they also destroyed each other because they were in contact. Uh, so in the very first instance, uh, there was uh, an enormous amount of energy, photons, that was produced. And if we count, uh, measure them, how many photons there are for every proton, so there's about a billion. That is to say, there's much more light photons than matter protons. This means that we think that at the beginning, probably they were the same amount. There was light and matter that had the same amount. Now, there's a, there are one to a billion ratio. 
So we believe that the matter and all the antimatter disappeared except one part per billion. And the part of antimatter, which should also be very limited, but should be, if it exists, is very distant, very distant from the matter. What does very distant mean? Can they be in, in our galaxy? Possibly, maybe, maybe so, maybe not. The galaxy is very empty, so there might be nuggets of antimatter which don't bother anyone. Certainly, there can't be large amounts of antimatter, otherwise, we'd see it in the annihilation of plasmas. But they might be galaxies that are very distant, which, in principle, are opposite of ours. There's as much, uh, there's more antimatter and less matter. We don't know about it. It's very easy to describe, but we really don't know how to explain it because possibly we need laws of physics that we haven't discovered yet, which is very interesting. For the Victor Hesse's of today. Now here, I've told you something which happened at the beginning of the Big Bang. So at this point, I would like to make a comparison. The universe, in a very chaotic way, in time and space, behaves like a large accelerator, produces particles. They were very high energy initially, which is what the accelerator does, the LHC does in Geneva. Uh, the, at this point, we have uh, a 14 tera electron volt of energy. What is a tera electron volt? It means that the energy of these particles uh, is uh, seven, 8,000 times the mass of a proton, which is a lot, a lot. Well, though, compared to what the Big Bang did or the cosmic ray energy, there are certainly, there's evidence that there are particles in the cosmos that have more energy than the ones that we produce in Geneva. Um, now, in one case, in the LHC, they're organized and tidy, but in the case of cosmic rays, there's everything and more about it, uh, and so we have to work to identify the ones we're interested in. This is why in the past 20 years, we've carried out experiments like the one that Piero Bianucci was talking about. That is to say, we have put some instruments in orbit, instruments that try to find the component of antimatter in the cosmic rays, because it's not very, there's no meaning to find it in, uh, on Earth. If we find an antiparticle here, it won't resist, as you know, the Poisson t electron tomography, which some of you may have uh, used in hospital. It is very important for some uh, uh, diagnosis, positron electron tomography. They create a positron that they produce photons, and so we have images. So antimatter is with us in every hospital in uh, with us, uh, but in very small quantities and for the time uh, that uh, produces some results. But mostly uh, in the cosmos, they work. Um, uh, so if I carry out an experiment, uh, uh, from above, uh, which looks at them very carefully, I may find antimatter. In 1994, a group of physicists, uh, about 20, they were Samuel Ting, who's a Nobel Prize and very well known. I was there. He discovered the fourth quark, uh, Chinese, Americans, Russians, uh, developed uh, an ex magnetic experiment uh, on the space station after a test run on the shuttle, and this is the article that they used. This is the magnet that was produced, manufactured in China with a series of magnetites, uh, the same that you have on the fridge, magnets. This is one meter in height, weighs two tons. A rather large fridge magnet, but it does the same sort of thing. That is to say that inside, the particles are bent. And exactly like Anderson did, they will go right with the, and they are positive and their matter, and to the left, their negative charge by measuring their mass and measuring their speed and photographing them one by one. What you can do is that you can find the antimatter component.
We had 10 days on the shuttle in 98, um, measuring cosmic rays. This was successful. We published articles. Uh, and then 2011 here, so 13 years later, we put this object in orbit, which is uh, the same magnet, but reorganized uh, in very differently, more sophisticated, some eight tons, uh, 300 uh, channels, uh, three kilowatts uh, pr consumption. It produces eight megabyte of data per second, an object uh, for which was enormous since the aim of for space and uh, to measure this uh, and to measure the amount of antimatter in cosmic rays plus other things but today we're talking about antimatter this is the international space station something which you are aware of in turin because you should know that about half uh, of uh, the the uh, place was where we live, the cylinder, the cargo that took a lot of the material, some of which remained in orbit, attached to the space system, was uh, manufactured the, by Alenia Space, which is very close to here. So f for Italy, for this city, it is a technological area. Here you see, it's, we've circled the IMS. This is a photograph, not a drawing. It's rather large, given uh, the size of the uh, orbiting uh, space station has. So we're talking about the Big Bang. We're talking about the fact that, as far as we know, about half of this story has never been written. Or it has been written, but it ha is now far away from sight. And this problem is the one which motivates uh, the MS team research. A few words uh, on the theoretical part. Uh, I know that I'm not mostly talking about uh, this not to physicists, but uh, Sakharov, who was a great physicist and a dissident in Russia when he was still active. As a physicist, uh, he tried to explain how it was possible how uh, in the in large ping pong between matter and antimatter, how matter prevailed on antimatter while remaining one part uh, of a billionth. It has to do with the violation of fundamental symmetry. You have to violate the baryonic number, the charge of symmetry, parity. You can do it, but you must uproot uh, part of the fundamental structure of the interactions, of the elementary interactions and of the elementary equations uh, which work in a very precise manner at all the energy scales that we've studied so far. Possibly in the initial phase with a very high amount of energy at the Big Bang, these equations uh, had a limit which currently we can't lim measure or see, which violating these numbers of fundamental symmetry might uh, be uh, create a situation which disfavored antimatter as opposed to matter. This is a manuscript which dates back when you still people typed still in 67. It's still true. That is to say, for antimatter to disappear, you have to unhinge the structure. Although some of the fundamentals uh, of theoretical part elementary particle physics, this might happen at higher energy. In this uh, representation, in this picture. You can see lots of things uh, which concern the first seconds of the universe on the x-axis. Uh, we have time. It's logarithmic. Here you see 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Uh, if you can imagine what it is, you're good, because I can't imagine it. Then 10 to the minus 35, minus 32. The fourth is 10 to the minus 10. And uh, it's one nanosecond, which is something that you can produce with the necessary instruments, and then 300 seconds, which uh, is uh, five minutes, that's a lot. In these uh, time packets, 
Some are very short, some are very long. The laws of physics with the universe, which rapidly was cooling down, change. Initially, at 10 to the minus 44, all the forces were as strong as each other. The weak electromagnetic gravity, it was a ping pong amongst equal forces. The masses were negligible, they were all the same, and this was a primeval, high energy situation, but immediately after, nearly after, gravity became much weaker. That is to say, the energy of gravity fell, which meant that gravity separated from other forces and became much, much, much weaker. The other three forces, that is to say, the, weak, the strong, the electromagnetic, and the weak, remained equally intense, but at 10 to the minus 35 seconds, roughly, the strong and the electro-weak separated. The strong remained very strong, and the electro-weak remained united, but then separated uh, when about after a tenth of a billionth of a second went by, and then the electromagnetic and weak separated. The electromagnetic is a bit stronger than the weak, and the weak is the one which is in, uh, responsible for beta decay. At CERN, here you have LEP, LEP, and LHC. We can test only those energies which correspond to those. We can reproduce to the origin of the universe, but only up to one billionth of a second or thereabouts, which is not bad, but compared to what happened before, there is a lot that we can't verify. We have no possibility, for example, to verify where the weak and strong forces meet, and even the less so when they all merge together with gravity. The phenomenon which I'm talking about, that is to say creation and disappearance of antimatter, happen in that very small time lag where the forces are very similar and they've just decoupled and possibly we have an additional force that we don't know and uh, which uh, is added to the scenario of the known forces. This is why in our labs on Earth uh, uh, we might uh, not see this phenomenon. This uh, it's a slide which I'm going to show you, not because I want you to read it, but to say that the theory which underlies what I'm saying is very complicated. Uh, there are various possibilities, various scenarios, uh, various possible scenarios. Another possibility which is different uh, is uh, for the domains uh, to separate some matter and some antimatter. It's not quite clear how this would happen. If there are areas of the universe that are full of matter and others that are full of antimatter, they must be very distant the one from the other because otherwise uh, they might produce a lot of light. We would see galaxies with a halo, the halo due to the annihilation of the particles with the antiparticles, uh, so we don't know how this would happen. I would also like you to think about another point. Uh, we've always spoken about anti-nucleus, anti-particles, so on and so forth. But uh, an idea of how the heavy atoms were produced must be mentioned. Here, in fact, uh, we are not only made up of, un of hydrogen, of helium, but also of iron and lead many other elements. Uh, where do these other atoms, the heavy atoms, come from? They come from the nucleus of stars. Uh, that is to say, the light, uh, because let us not forget that the Big Bang produced uh, hydrogen and a little bit of helium and transferred them in, lithium, so on, up to iron and uranium. But it's the stars that forming them, them when they formed, increased the pressure, the inner temperature, so much so, and therefore the probability of uh, uh, creating uh, heavy atoms. Hence, they exploded, and then after a few billion years, they meet again. And at the end, we are uh, our iron was in the same star a few billion years ago. Because we're the children of the stars. To have anti-nucleus of antimatter, you need anti-stars. So the same mechanism must be transported. We need a lot of antimatter to create uh, anti-nucleon, beryllium, borium, helium, and whatever.
So if we saw this in the cosmic rays, if we saw one, suddenly we would know that there's an entire universe that awaits us uh, somewhere, although we're not quite clear where. So it's the paradox. Uh, it would be enough uh, to see what Anderson saw, to see one clearly, and immediately uh, we would have a, an important chapter of our understanding of the universe. Uh, this uh, maybe can be seen uh, from space. Why is space so important? Dilbert, you're aware of Dilbert. Um, Dilbert is a comic strip. Uh, he, uh, Dilbert asks uh, the uh, dustman, I created an anti-Dilbert, but I don't know how to prevent him from being annihilated by matter when he leaves the vacuum. And uh, the dustman says, if you don't know how to do it and he's an anti-you, it means he knows how. So he goes uh, to ask the Auntie Dilbert, uh, how do you do it? And he says, uh, matter screen, sun protection factor 50. That is to say, you have to uh, put an anti-matter cream on me. But it's a joke, but it's, uh, um, it's an idea that explains why even uh, the Manhattan uh, dustmen know how to do it. So in the end, we built this experiment, which is very complicated, international cooperation, 600 people. And uh, on a small level, what we do in CERN in accelerators, this is a magnetic spectrometer, a uh, multipurpose spectrometer, lots of computers, uh, a magnetic field, a silicon tracker, all this for space. And this is the difficulties because of the vibration shock, reliability, you can't, it has to be very reliable because you can't repair it. There has to be low energy consumption. And this, uh, in fact, um, it was the second one was called Pamela. This gives you an idea of the size of the ability to measure rare events is the link to the fact that it's big because if I have to look for a white or a pink elephant, I have to look at lots of elephants to find the right one. And the same thing is for antimatter. If uh, there are parts per billion, I have to gather thousands of billions of parts. Um, and then it has to be very reliable because if by any chance I see one, two, three, they won't be 300 if I just see one, two, or three of these particular heavy uh, part anti particles, anti helium in this case, we have to be sure that it's a not noise and therefore reliability has to be extremely good. And that's a difficult uh, to do something very stable that offers these uh, levels of reliability. In the end, IMS is a camera that can tell the various particles according to the signal that I have. The acronyms don't mean the uh, TRD is a, and we have time of light or uh, whatever. Here you see trackers, rich. You see these electrons uh, leave a certain signal in the TRD or in the TOF, in the tracker. They have a circle in the rich and the spray in the ECAL. Whatever they do, we have to let's see the positrons. They do the same in the TRD in the TOF, and they a circle in the rich and the spray in the ical. And the only difference is how they bend. And all the other particles can have characteristics that are similar or different. But the important uh, uh, the importance is to see where they bend in the magnetic field exactly like Anderson did. Only in this case, we're not looking for a proton or antiprotons because we know that they exist in small quantities. But what we're looking is anti-helium, anti-boron, anti, uh, which we know and so on, which we're very, very, very rare. This is the object. Uh, just before we assembled it uh, on the transporter, which the cargo that took it to the States and then the shuttle, the international cooperation with 600 physicists. It, Italy is very strong with IA, uh, Institute of National, um, the INFN, uh, the National Institute of Nuclear Physics. Um, we had to have a transporter. There was a special one. What's it called? I can't remember. C5, I think it's called. Yes, I traveled inside it uh, um, because it transports uh, military cargoes normally, but this enormous box with it was the object. Uh, so it was very large. Uh, it was so big that at a certain point it didn't even fit in the airplane. Then we managed to, incredible, to transport it. And this was uh, the integration to take it up to the shuttle on the 
the shuttle on the cargo. The shuttle was then attached to the vertical boosters. You see, since 2012, the shuttle has no longer uh, been in use, but this was 2011. Once it was attached to the pr primary booster and then the secondary booster, the solid ones, the vertical ones, it moves on this sort of armored tank, which takes it to the launch base, and then it, there you are. It left after about 20 years' work, since 94 to 2011. First idea, first flight, and then in the end, 17 years later, finally it left. Going into space is a complicated thing. It weighs about eight tons, and the shuttle weighs 110 tons. To put this into orbit, uh, you need an object which only for the part of tanks uh, full of solid and liquid fuel weighs 1,900 tons. So over 2,000, 2,008 tons uh, to put eight in orbit and for the shuttle 110. And these tons a fuel are burnt very rapidly because that's what imparts the thrust and sends it up. And we know that rockets are great when they start, but it's very difficult to put them into orbit. And it's Newton's laws that make it possible for us uh, to leave the Earth and this is what nature gives us unless we discover that after 120, 30, 123 seconds, 1,000 tons of fuels had been spent. In 120 seconds, basically 10 a second, tons. I don't know if you realize what we're talking about. And then you're in orbit, you get to the space station. You've got the Canadian arm for IMS, attach it to, to its point there. You see it's been attached. The installation has been completed. And a few hours later, we start gathering data. Particles which come from everywhere are invisible, but he, it can see them. It, uh, it can see the ones that are coming from above and sends them through the space station, through its channel, sends them down to Earth. Uh, we have 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We have teams uh, that uh, gather the data um, at the operation center. This is the photo of some of my uh, collaborators, the ones uh, uh, which some are students, uh, some are researchers, uh, who've spent most of their life uh, to find a few particles of antimatter. And this is what we're talking about also. And the aim is uh, to have a part per 10 billion. And when the knowledge of physics uh, will give us uh, the limits, we know uh, that there are less uh, than a part per billion. And here we're measuring billions and billions of normal particles. Uh, cosmic rays are mostly all the things that are stable, protons, electrons, all the nucleuses, helium, lithium, beryllium, bor boron, up to uranium. That's the stable ones. The unstable ones, there are a few, few, but all of them, and clearly all the stable antimatter particles, positrons and antiprotons, one out of 10,000. And we're expecting on the basis of known physics, one or two anti-deuteron after four, five, six years data, and we don't expect any anti-helium uh, three or four if it goes on, because it's possible to produce it in the collision of cosmic rays with the residues uh, of uh, interplanetary interstar gas should not generate any anti-helium because we're expecting many fewer. We have gathered about 80 billion events in the first four years, and we published a number of works, the measurement of positrons, there's some results, but now we're starting to work on this mine of data. One of the important objectives of this experiment is to see 
If in this 8 billion events uh, or particles, we find some anti heavy antiparticle. These are the signals, the circles I was mentioning before, which the nucleus is, the nuclei. Uh, the ones on the left is nitrogen, two tera electron volts of energy. The second is a neon. These are all nucleuses uh, wandering in the universe, ionized, accelerated, and we can uh, create them one at a time. These are the distribution of the nuclei from hydrogen, helium, to cobalt, to iron. We measure the energy, the quantity, and this is the known part of physics. Uh, but we expect uh, them to be here. If we were to see one anti-helium, we would be very, very, very happy. Currently, the limits, uh, which I say a part, well, here's one billionth, uh, one part of billionth, well, less than a billionth of antimatter, right up to about uh, 10 giga electron volt of energy, and we will improve at least uh, 1,000 times the sensitivity a hundred times and a million times at higher energies. That is to say that we're bringing down this limit, either if we're lucky uh, or if we're good, and if we see a particle in this range of sensitivity which is explored for the first time, and we will have answers in a few months, because after four years of measurements and calibration, it's uh, the main objective of the data analysis. I was saying that in space, uh, you can also see other types of antimatter, positrons. So we're expecting that from collisions of uh, cosmic rays with, with normal matter, we have a small but not zero, a five per thousand part. To identify them, we have to measure them, but we can do that. And why is it important uh, to study positrons? Uh, because they're antimatter, but uh, they're antimatter that is easily produced, which has nothing to do with the Big Bang. But positrons uh, are expected on another type of uh, uh, problem, which is dark matter. <coughs> we have discovered that our universe is made out of three types of uh, matter, matter, dark matter, and a type of dark matter which is uh, uh, hidden in the vacuum. So if we have 100, matter, normal matter, we're made of is less than 5%, including light, uh, light and neutrinos. Dark matter is 24%, uh, and uh, the dark energy is 72%, which is about three times uh, dark matter. So our matter, which we're so proud of, not only is uh, one billionth, uh, but it's also a very small fraction of the matter which the universe is made of, which is dark. It does not uh, emit light, but we know because of the gravitational reasons that it is present. Uh, we have been looking for it in all possible ways. So there is great evidence looking at galaxies that it exists, uh, that it fills the universe, this room too, although invisible. We've been trying it at LHC. We've been tried it, trying to find it under the Gran Sasso and also in space because there might be annihilation of uh, uh, dark matter against its antimatter, uh, uh, which would produce uh, positron protons uh, more than the ones we expect. So the measurement of positrons uh, is very important for this reason. when the antimatter will give us information on a completely different phenomenon, which is that of dark matter. When you think of galaxies, of our galaxy or other galaxies, uh, uh, currently we think of them as a p part which is visible that is very small, surrounded by a halo of dark matter that determines its shape, whether it's spiral, globular, or flat because this uh, uh, halo that surrounds it uh, has developed um, or developed uh, billions of years ago in uh, the, uh, that area of the universe. Positrons, uh, the cosmic rays, uh, are expected, um, but we think that they will decline with the more energy there is. Uh, 
the relationship is about 10%, but we expected it to uh, drop at higher energy levels. The unusual thing is that this relationship uh, grows uh, with uh, energy. These are, th- these are predictions that we have in, in theory, but it might be due to the decay or annihilation of a dark particle. Um, This is possible, and that the curious thing is that we've seen very clearly that the the ratio at 10% here is at about 1 GeV, GeV, then it increases, and this was also observed um, in other experiments, but above two or three hundred GEVs, it flattens out and possibly it declines. This trend, which is very particular, which it means it goes, it increases and then it flattens out at plateaus and then it decreases, might be considered um, of Uh, due to dark matter, because if we had uh, dark matter to produce this, an energy which then finishes, it might, this might explain it, uh, or other phenomena like pulsars uh, have a much uh, slower trend, as you see. So when we will have in 10 years or five or six years, we will have enough measurements, maybe we will be able to identify which ones are the pulsar was measurements or a more limited phenomenon, which is due to dark matter. So these measurements on positrons uh, have created a great discussion because there's something new. And in this case, you see, we use the antimatter to study dark matter. So. I've now reached the end of uh, uh, my presentation. I just wanted to make a comparison. This AMS on the space station is a bit uh, like an LHC, and the costs, uh, too, are not so strange because LHC costs um, 10 times less than the space stations. It costs more than $10 billion, the AMS. LHS, uh, LHC costs only $10 billion. With inside, uh, I mean, you know, it's uh, very expensive. Uh, LHC has four big experiments, and the ISS uh, has only one experiment, uh, which costs a lot because uh, something so big in space uh, costs a lot. There are two ways of studying high energy looking at the cosmic rays with great accuracy or carrying out uh, experiments uh, with the particle accelerator. And in the end, They compete, I mean, which one will work best? Uh, We know that Cosmos, per se, is the ultimate laboratory because everything happened from the Big Bang onwards. Uh, The problem is to try and find it, to find the signal in this uh, sea of signals, which are very often noisy or surrounded by noise, but but a bit of patience so we can find them. While uh, uh, the LHC, although it's uh, very efficient, uh, reaches certain objectives, but it can't go beyond certain energy. Which one will give us better results? Uh, The LHC or the who will find the dark matter first? We don't know, and this is part of a scientific competition. And I would like to conclude with a remark uh, which I think is uh, important to explain what science is. Science uh, of nuclear Physics is a big science. It needs large accelerators, large experiments, maybe in the space. And every time you try and identify this and say, what are we going to do? What's the next frontier? What is uh, the next accelerator? It's interesting to observe that one of the original objectives uh, is what you have. But if you're lucky, you also discovered other things. In Brookhaven in the 60s, uh, They had the AGS, an accelerated study, a, the interaction between pions and nucleons. Uh, with uh, particularly accurate instruments, they discovered two types of two kinds of neutrinos. Uh, the violation of uh, the non-symmetry, which is a fine, which is one of the fundamental ones, uh, the time reversal, and the fourth quark. All these things linked to Nobel Prizes. At Batavia, in the Fermi lab, 
had had an accelerator to study neutrinos, and they discovered the fifth and sixth quark. The fifth received the Nobel Prize, the sixth one hasn't. At the SLAC in California, uh, the uh, study was built to study quantum electron dynamics. They discovered uh, the fourth quark uh, separately from Brookhaven at the same time, uh, the third electron, the tau, and uh, the mu tau, that is the possible neutrons, uh, and the parton structures of the nucleons. In Petra in Hamburg, uh, they were looking for the sixth quark, which was not uh, found, but the gluon was found, uh, which is the photon of the strong interactions. Then uh, an, uh, the super Kamiokando, which is under a mountain, to study proton decay, which was never seen, but they discovered that neutrinos had a mass Nobel Prize. So the IMS, the AMS on the ISS has been uh, developed to find dark matter or antimatter, but maybe, and let us hope, we will find something different. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Batistone.